Stories from the East and West. Hi, Nitsan. Hi, John. What do you have for me today? Today, I'm going to tell you the story of a World War II soldier named Wojtek. A war story? Yes, indeed. He travelled in an army from the Middle East to North Africa and fought in Italy, including the pivotal Battle of Monte Cassino. I'll also tell you about his status as a war hero and about how popular he was with his fellow soldiers. How does that sound? Well, I mean, it's not that I don't find war stories interesting, but this doesn't sound particularly special. Okay, well, I did leave out one tiny detail. Which is? He was a bear. Oh, the war bear! Wait, 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 what was his name again? Wojtek. Wojtek the soldier bear. The bear that joined the army. Do you know his story? Only bits and pieces, but he served as an actual soldier in World War II, right? Not just like a mascot. Exactly. Think our listeners would like to hear about him? I really, really do. Hi, my name's John. And I'm Nitan. And this is Stories from the East and West. In today's show, the story of a Syrian brown bear that was incorporated into, or maybe I should say adopted by, the Polish army. Not only did he become its symbol and mascot, but he performed heroically as a soldier. You know, John, maybe before we get into the story, we could give our listeners a quick introduction to events in Eastern Europe during the first years of World War II. They might not know exactly what was going on. Absolutely. Would you like to do the honours? Just a brief intro about the start of the war and the origins of the army Wojtek served in. I'll help you out a bit and take over when Wojtek enters the story. Happy to. Okay, so let me start from this old documentary intro. Poland, September 1939. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest and sets the stage for World War II. Poland's 34 million inhabitants, crushed, scattered, and enslaved. Tens of thousands of square miles of territory shrink before the movement of lightning-armored columns. Poland and the world learn the meaning of a grim new word. Blitzkrieg. After the invasion, Poland's allies declared war on Nazi Germany. But they didn't do much else. Poland was left to fight more or less alone against an overwhelmingly stronger enemy. Things went from bad to worse when on September 17th, the Soviet Union joined the German offensive and invaded Poland from the east. Together, these two powerful armies crushed Poland's resistant attempts. In a little over a month, Poland was wiped off the map. Yes. Soon after their victory, both occupiers started the mass exile of Polish citizens. Soldiers were obviously the first to be sent away. Let me check the numbers. Approximately 200,000 of them were sent to the most distant places in the Soviet Union and imprisoned in gulags. Over one and a half million Polish civilians soon followed. Poland was never to reappear. One of the civilians deported to Siberia was Irena Bokiewicz. The Russians told us that just as we can't see our ears with our own eyes, we would never see Poland again. Some hope came from something pretty unexpected. In 1941, at the height of their offensive campaign, Nazi Germany attacked its ally, the Soviet Union. Stalin was forced to pick a new side. He accepted the Allied forces' offer, and even though he didn't really want to, he re-established diplomatic relations with Poland. According to the subsequent agreement, called the sikorsky maisky Agreement after its signatories, all the exiled Polish soldiers and citizens that had survived were released from their Soviet prison camps. They were told they were allowed to reunite under General Władysław Anders to form a new army. Mind you, the Soviets, having been forced to release them all, didn't exactly give them a ticket home. Mysterious obstacles started piling up, like there weren't enough trains or people accidentally got the wrong information about where to go. There were even a few acts of open sabotage. 
Right, but the army did eventually come together and began crawling its way back to Europe. It was known simply as Anders' army. And that's the moment when Wojtek joins the story. Finally! Yes, it was 1942, and this huge group, around 40,000 people, was moving slowly south through Iran. They were heading towards Iraq, then Syria, Palestine, and finally Egypt. In Egypt, the army section was to link up with British command, while the civilians were given passage to Europe. Oh yeah, um, North Africa was sort of a waiting room, right? Like a transfer station for Allied soldiers and civilians? Exactly, which is why they were heading there. But before they got to North Africa, they were still in Iran. Some civilians from a temporary camp near Tehran noticed two boys carrying an injured little brown bear. They learned that the rest of its family had just been shot by hunters. In a sudden wave of sympathy, they decided to buy him on the spot for a handful of Persian coins, some chocolate, a Swiss knife, and a tin of beef. They took him back to their camp and started feeding him with milk, cans and any food they had. Right away, they gave him a common Polish name, Wojtek, a diminutive of Wojciech, which means smiling warrior. Without wanting to reveal too much too early, we can say that it turned out to be a prophetic name. And speaking of Wojtek, let me introduce somebody who was there at the time. My name is Wojciech Naremski. I am Emeritus Professor uh, of Polish Academy of Sciences and ex-soldier of the uh, Polish Second Corps, which was fighting in Italy under the British command within the 8th British Army. Wait, you mean you managed to actually interview somebody who served with Wojtek in the same unit? That was over 70 years ago. They'd have to be like... Over 90 years old, exactly. Wojtek Naremski was the only soldier in the company with the same name as the bear, so they grew a very special relationship. They were called Small Wojtek and Big Wojtek. I love it. So how did Big Wojtek end up in the army? I'll let my noble interviewee answer this question. arrived to company. I was accepted by Major Kolkowski. He, he told me, oh, so we have the second Wojtek. So you will be the little one and he will be the big one. <laughs> the bear was raised among people from a cub and he fit right in with his brothers in arms. Other soldiers said he would go on guard duty, wrestle and box with them, winning all of his fights but never harming anybody, mind you. Apparently, he even picked up some of their, let's say, less salubrious habits. When he grown up, he started to, to create troubles. You know, he was stealing some food from, from the magazines, you know. From, or from the kitchen. <laughs> so therefore they decided that no, he must be yeah. given to the army. And so began his history. And I was with him two years, you know, from Palestine to Iraq. Afterwards, again to, to Palestine. Egypt and Italy. As for carrying out duties, they started by teaching him how to salute, then how to watch over trucks by sitting in the driver's cabin. His strength was obviously a plus, and he learned how to carry ammunition crates and even stack them. Pretty quickly, this big friendly giant became the favorite figure amongst all the Allied units stationed near the regiment. I think it was a mistake, you know. My colleagues were giving him bottles or rather don't often uh, cans, can, you know, cans yes, can because Australian beer was usually, um, and, and uh, he liked it afterwards, you know, he was asking <laughs> if he had seen that somebody didn't go, that he also wants to drink. Of course, for him, you know, he was weighing afterwards more than 200 kilograms, you know, so for him, 
one bottle or one can of beer, it was nothing really, you know, only for pleasure. <laughs> Um, John, I don't mean to sound like a Grinch, but this does sound a bit like a fairy tale, like a kid's story. A friendly bear sitting in the front of a truck, playing and wrestling with soldiers, helping them out with their duties? Come on, I mean, bears are wild animals, and we all know what that means. These types of friendships always end up with the bear eating somebody? I couldn't believe it either. Maybe it was just one of those soldiers' wartime stories, a tale repeated so many times people just assume it's true. So, in search of evidence, I talked to an animal behaviorist, specifically... Tadeusz Kaleta, uh, Associate Professor, uh, Warsaw University of Life Sciences, Cathedra of Animal Genetics. I asked if taming a bear to that extent was even theoretically possible. At first, he made me doubt the story even more. When I asked if bears were social, he said... No, uh, the bear is practically solitary animal. There are two cases uh, in which you can observe two or more uh, bears. One is, of course, reproduction, mating, and the second is the situation when animal uh, gather around the big uh, animal, like a, I don't know, like a, for example. Uh, in the case of polar bear, it's, 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 a, it's a whale, for example. Of course. But then I told him Wojtek's story, which he surprisingly didn't know much about. When I asked if an orphaned bear brought up by friendly people might socialize, he wasn't so strict with his opinion. I think that when, when uh, the bond between the young bear and uh, human beings um, begin very early, there is a big chance that uh, that this young bear will um, treat these uh, human beings as its own family. Mm -hmm. So it will socialize and and will uh, follow the human beings like 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 it follow the, the mother. So it's almost a, a kind of natural instinct, right? Yes, of course. So science says Wojtek's story is at least plausible. But also for the skeptics, there's film footage of Wojtek. It actually shows him wrestling with his soldier friends. There are also photos of him sitting in a truck. There's a photo of him holding a bottle of beer. Plus, you can't argue with the daily army logs recorded by the 22nd Transport Company itself. It's undeniable. Wojtek's story is 100% genuine. Sure, some people do exaggerate, like saying he was a chain smoker or that he carried ammunition to the front line under gunfire, neither of which are true. But basically, most of these stories really are, well, real. OK, I guess I can believe it. There's still one thing I don't get, though. A fully grown bear has to eat tons of food. But these guys were trekking across the desert on the most basic rations. How on earth did they manage to keep him fed? They must have barely had enough for themselves. I'm glad you asked. The answer's actually linked to one of the best anecdotes about Wojtek. The Anders army was in Port Said in Egypt, where they had been ordered to board a ship to Italy. They were loading their equipment, lining up one by one, showing their papers to the British to get on the ship. Suddenly... Wojtek shows up? Exactly. Seemingly out of nowhere, a huge bear was standing in front of a British officer waiting to board. Reportedly, the officer almost passed out from fear. After pulling himself together in the true British fashion, though, he began insisting that the rules didn't allow animals to be transported. He said the bear had to stay in Africa. He was soon shocked to learn that Wojtek had officially been nominated a private a few months earlier. It was a way of making sure Wojtek was eligible for food rationing. Legally, he wasn't a bear, but a regular soldier with his own number, paybook and unit assignment. A regular soldier, so they had to let him on the ship. Yes, and it turned out to be a very smart decision. Soon after arriving in Italy, Anders' army was ordered to assault the German stronghold of Monte Cassino, one of the most fortified points in Europe. Now that was a famous battle. Monte Cassino was like a monastery turned fortress on top of a mountain. That's right. And the battle was when Wojtek, carrying a shell, became the official emblem of his company. Reportedly, he often helped stack heavy crates. Usually... An animal likes to do the same what does his proprietor, you know, a man. 
And there were, when he has seen that we are tiring very much, wearing the, the, the boxes with artillery shells, he approached, you know, and tried to help us. And he was helping, really. But ultimately, Wojtek's presence was crucial from a very different standpoint. You know, each commander should be a psychologist. And he... The commander of the 22nd Artillery Supply Company... ...knew that the presence of a friendly animal improves the, the atmosphere, you know, and improves the morale even of soldiers, you know. Of course, the Battle of Monte Cassino was famously one of the most psychologically draining. There were snipers on all four sides of the fortress and endless casualties. Morale must have been extremely low. Having a friendly bear at their side must have helped distract them from the carnage around them. They must have felt at least a little bit better. I'd even say a lot better. We could say they were getting constant zoo therapy, or barotherapy, so to speak. Nowadays, therapists often use animals to help cure post-traumatic stress disorder, commonly known as PTSD. The importance of Wojtek's calming presence at Monte Cassino can't be stressed enough. OK, so back to the story. We all know the Allies won the Battle of Monte Cassino. What happened to Wojtek and his company next? And, well, like a lot of soldiers that go on leave, they went off to go pick up some girls. It was June, July and August, you know, so rather hot period in Italy. And uh, I remember once we stopped on the road, at this Adriatic road. It was about 50 meters from the sea, you know, only. And he escaped, really. And the, the, the Italian girls were taking baths also on the, on the beach, yes. And, uh, and they were, oh! <laughs> they, they began to cry and they said, don't cry, don't, 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 don't be afraid. This bear is well educated. He will, he will not... <laughs> Doing nothing bad. <laughs> Soon after, the Axis powers were finally beaten. And then, when the moment of happiness seemed so close for these soldiers, these men who had been exiled halfway across the world, who had dragged their way back fighting to reclaim their home, when it seemed like finally everything was going to be OK... Oh, no. The Alta Conference? Yes. 200,000 Poles had fought in the Allied armies, hoping to return to the home they were exiled from. But the end of the war didn't mean their hopes would come true. They had to deal with what was decided over their heads at the Yalta Conference. Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin decided that Poland fell on the Soviet side of the Iron Curtain. Józef Mozdzeń, a soldier from Anders' army, summed up how they felt. We knew that the government in Warsaw had been deemed legitimate. The satellite pro-communist government, in fact, established in Moscow. Meanwhile, recognition of the government in exile had been withdrawn, and all of the five years of grinding life and constant fear of being killed at any time, risking our lives for a free Poland, became strictly for the birds. Eventually, it turned out that Poland wasn't free, and our fight was for nothing. The soldiers of Anders' army had nowhere to go. The memory of prisons and work camps in Soviet Russia were too strong for them to return to a Soviet-ruled Poland. Moreover, their status in the new Poland was very uncertain. Officially, they were deemed former Soviet prisoners, released only thanks to Stalin's so-called amnesty. Anders' army's war ended up in Camp Winfield in Scotland, and that included Wojtek. The soldiers stayed at the refugee camp there with nothing to do and nowhere to go. After a while, the Allied forces stopped paying their wages and they decided to disband, trying to figure out how to get on with their lives as civilians. They were only reluctantly welcomed in the United Kingdom, but returning to Poland was just far too dangerous. But what about Wojtek? 
For Wojtek, things were even more complicated. From his first days in the Polish army, soldiers had dreamt of taking him back to Poland. They had seen themselves in a victory parade, walking with him through the streets of Warsaw. A parade like that, however, was never going to happen. Meanwhile, in 1946 in Scotland, there was nobody who could take care of Wojtek. His fellow soldiers had a hard time deciding what to do with him. Eventually, thanks to the support of one of the British commanders, one who had met Wojtek in Palestine, they managed to find a place for him in Edinburgh Zoo. He instantly became the zoo's most visited animal and earned much more money than needed for his upkeep. However, the most important part of the agreement between the zoo and Wojtek's caretakers was that if Poland ever regained its freedom, he would immediately be given back and sent to Poland. Unfortunately, Wojtek died long before Poland became a fully independent state, on December 2nd, 1962. Many of the soldiers who served with Wojtek wrote about him in their memoirs. They emphasize how his being an orphan with no home immediately made him one of them, that his human-like behavior was a source of both pride and delight for them all. He was definitely one of the brightest rays of sunshine in the tragic history of Anders' army and its soldiers, many of whom never saw their homeland again. It's such a sad story, but some of the soldiers did live long enough to see a free and independent Poland, though. They just had to wait for over four decades. But you know, thinking about Wojtek, one thing confuses me. Don't you think we could say that Wojtek the bear, I mean, that he kind of became more human than animal? Well, I guess it depends on your definition of humanity, but... After some time, animal will adapt to the new condition. But, but firstly, there will be, there will be an emotional state uh, uh, which resembles uh, the state in human beings. It is very strange that for us, we are so accustomed to him that for us it was quite normal that we have a bear. Such big bear you know, and very polite, you know, very polite. <laughs> because, you know, I, I can say that he was feeling to be a human being, educated among uh, men, you know. He didn't feel to be a bear. Really. <laughs> this episode of Stories from the East and West was a Wirewalker studio production for Culture.pl. Our team included Wojciech Oleksiak, Adam Żuławski, John Beecham, Nitsan Reisner and our intern Barbara Rogala. Many thanks to Professor Wojciech Naremski and Professor Tadeusz Kaleta for joining us on this episode. To see the notes from this episode, just tap the show out in your podcast app or visit storiesfromtheeastandwest.com. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe for future episodes. And remember to give us a review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help others find the podcast too. <laughs>